Hey guys, welcome back to day two of the new office build. Today I'm gonna to be going through basically my build list of the new computer. Everything is gonna be new except two parts that are pulling over from the old system, that being my Blu-ray drive, which simply they haven't improved in the last several years anyway, and a very good high-speed card reader slash USB 3 drive that I like in the front of my computer because I do a lot of photo and video editing. So cards go in and out of that computer all day long, every day. It's very important to have it nice and convenient. I don't really care for the desktop external ones because I like to just put the card in the slot. I don't like to have to fiddle with it and hold it or I'd have to Velcro it to the table. And you know what? I haven't found an external one that is really as fast as the good internal one that I have. So I'm pulling that over. Other than that, everything is brand new. Let's start out with the elephant in the room, the Corsair Obsidian 650D case. Now, some of you might be saying, dude, that's a really old case. Yes, it is. And they've actually already discontinued it, but you can still get new stock. I have very specific case wants and needs. Number one, I'm not overly flashy. I don't even care that this has a window. They have a non-windowed version, but this one was on sale. So I took the windowed version. I would have perfectly liked the one without a window. My current system doesn't have a window doesn't matter to me whatsoever. What I'm interested in is the functionality of it. I want to have the front available for my front mounted devices. I don't like any kind of panel that I have to open because like I said, I'm in and out of the thing all the time. So no front doors. I wanted filters built in. This has a front filter for the intake fan. It has a bottom filter for the power supply. That's very important. My current case doesn't have any filters. It has a internal filter that I put on the front fan and it's one of those kind of foam deals that just sticks to the front of the fan instead of a grill. Pain in the butt to clean instead of having something integral to the case. And likewise with the rear, I'm always having to brush things off of the, the mesh grills, not true filters. So that was important. Most cases these days have that, but this was one of the first. This, I believe this case is going on five or six years old. So for computer speak, that's ancient, but it's still very up to date overall. It's a clean industrial design. It's completely toolless, doesn't even have thumb screws. The sides have, I'll show this in detail when I go through the build, but the sides just have quick little spring latches. They're solid, they're secure, no rattles, no squeaks. The whole thing is aluminum and steel, solid as a rock. Tons of room inside, it's extra tall and extra wide. This was important because, as I will show you in a second, I'm going with a top-mounted dual radiator, all-in-one cooling system. This more than accommodates that, more than most cases. In fact, this will take those that use the 140 millimeter fans instead of the standard 120. The case comes with a 200 millimeter fan up top. So if you want to air cool, it's a decent option. It also has a single 200 millimeter fan in the front. I am, however, removing the top in place of the radiator and replacing the one in front in favor of a silent one because I do value silence. And although reports on this in the low speed position are it's pretty quiet, reports also say that these fans that are built into the case fail within a couple of years. So don't need that. For 15 bucks, I picked up a nice 200 millimeter fan. That is the only part I'm actually working, uh, waiting on. That's coming in a couple days, but it's not going to hold up the build. So we're going full steam ahead. So other than that, completely modular inside, two different sections of drive bays that you can swap into multiple positions, lots of space for as many drives as I want to put in there. And I do sometimes have the need to put in a lot of internal drives. I had as many as eight in my current system. I'm down to two opticals, the SSD, and three hard drives now in the old one. And I have a lot of space left in that. But that's been consolidated down over the years as drives got bigger, as I upgraded, consolidated to smaller spaces. You want to, you want to run as few drives as you possibly can. You want to save power, heat, longevity, chances of things failing. So that's what I've done here. The current build here, I'm only going with an SSD built onto the motherboard and two hard drives and one optical. So a lot less power draw. So that was my thinking on the case and I'm very happy with it. It does have a couple of unique features, one of which I'm removing immediately. Up here in the top, 
This is a spring-loaded door and it gives you the standard loadout of what they used to do for I.O. built into a case. Couple USB 3s, USB 2. This will date it. A Firewire port, um, audio out, headphone, and a mic in. No one ever uses those audio ports. They're absolutely useless. I have never touched them on mine. They're built into mine now too along the bottom of the case of all places. The design of these is without exception poor when they build those things into the case. For example, the USB ports on this, they're all about two millimeters apart. That means you can't put in two jump drives. You can barely put in two USB cables. They touch each other. So they're just useless. At least with the one I have, they're mounted horizontally so you can put in two devices, but it's mounted on the very bottom lip of the case. If you're on the floor, you're not gonna be reaching down the floor to put things in and out, especially if it's a drive cable. So that's coming out because number one, I'll never use it. Number two, it'll save me a lot of internal clutter because I get rid of about five different cables coming out the back of it that connect to the motherboard. So forget that mess, don't use it. I have a high speed USB built into my internal card reader anyway. So that's all I ever use for popping in a jump drive or I go into one of my monitor slots, whatever's more convenient. The other thing this has that's unique, and I haven't seen this in a little while because the need was never great. And that's a built-in top slot for popping in hot swappable SATA drives, which is really handy if you do say video work and you're working with hard drives. Some cameras out there, some video cameras still record to hard drives. So it's really convenient to just it's got a slot on the top, you just pop the drive in. You don't have to open your case. You don't need an external device. That's what I use now. I don't use it for video. I use it for when I have to repair people's computers and I have to pull data off a drive or transfer or fix something. Now, I don't have to open up my case, connect a cable, leave something dangling. I just pop it in the top and I can get rid of the much slower external connection bay. So overall, very happy with the case. Definitely check it out if you have needs like me. Now, if you're a gamer, it's not gonna appeal to you, probably, because the design is very plain and industrial. And I'm the opposite of what the typical gamer design is today. Angular, flashy, LEDs all over the place. Not me, not for what I want in my office. So this really appealed to me. All right, starting from the back to move our way through the list. Very important, especially if you have any kind of power grid issues, which we do here in Florida, it's terrible. Lots of spikes, depending on the county, lots of blackouts. This is an APC uninterruptible power supply or UPS. Basically, if you don't know about them, you plug your devices into this, this plugs into the wall. If there's any fluctuation in the power grid, it doesn't affect what you have plugged into it at all. Power goes up, power goes down, spikes, dips, power out, no problem. Your device keeps going and it doesn't see anything because it's running through a middleman, a 12 volt battery system built into it. Now here's the key. You'll see them advertised as four port, six port, eight port, or in this case, 10 port outlet. Cut that number in half because it's a little bit of a marketing BS thing. Half of them, are fully battery backed up. They will run off the system. They're completely isolated from the grid. That's what you want to plug into and use, especially for sensitive things like your main computer or monitors. The only thing you can't plug into it that way is a laser printer because that draws so much power, it will overload the system when it first turns on or starts printing. So you may have to go into a surge only for a laser printer, but other than that, you can plug anything you want into the battery side. And that's the key. The other half are just surge protected. They're not on the battery backup system. While they will probably protect you from most things, especially spikes and the like, you are not protected against power drops. So if you, for example, put an external hard drive into the surge only side instead of the battery backup side, that drive's gonna turn off if the power cuts out or if it dips too low. So bear that in mind. If you need uptime, you have to use the battery protection side, not the surge side. So take the numbers with a grain of salt, cut them in half. For me, it's very important to have as many outlets as possible. And what you get with the ones that are larger, like the eight or 10 outlet, usually a couple of them are spaced apart. So you can plug in those bigger wall warts 
for example, many external drives. Normally, they're spaced very close together, like a normal power strip, and you either have to use adapter dongles, which are fairly inexpensive, but still a little unsightly, but you can plug anything direct into at least two of the ports on the larger units. They're not that expensive. I suggest shopping on Amazon. I used to get them at Sam's. I used to get them uh, actually a little bit bigger than this. This is a 750 VA, more than enough for this system or anything I've built in recent years. You could have tons of drives in here and you're not gonna pull much out of this. Sam's used to have an 850 for about 80 bucks. Well, the company stopped manufacturing it. I went to buy one the other day and all they had at Sam's was this huge office tower unit. It was like 650 VA, way overkill for what I needed and I didn't need to spend 160 bucks. So got this guy on Amazon. It's a 10 outlet, very happy. Moving on to the heart of the system or at least the spinal cord, the motherboard. Now. First of all, the entire build when you are choosing a computer is going to be based around your processor. That's going to determine what chipset you have to use. From there, you get to pick exactly which motherboard, what features are important to you, what brands appeal to you. Maybe you're going for a color scheme. For me, color scheme didn't matter. Like I said, it's not a display item. I was going for number one, most important to me, reliability, longevity, problem-free design. I have had, I have built, I don't know, 20 different computers in my life. I've never bought one off the shelf. From 486s and up, I have built my own systems and modified them and configured them. I've done everything in the past. I was one of the first ones when they were making their own cooling systems. I was using the heater core out of a car for a radiator and an aquarium pump and doing my own tubing. And yes, I had one blow up and absolutely fry my computer. These were the things we had to go through back in the day. I've been overclocking since overclocking existed, since we were using pencils to make shorts. One of the first ones was the legendary Celeron overclock where you could basically double the speed of your chip. Fantastic deals out there. So I've always been techie. But longevity, oh my goodness, I have had problems in the past with, now mind you, this was really before the days of important things like online reviews, before Newegg and Amazon were the two big forces in the electronics purchasing industry, you had to take your chances, I'll tell you what. But big things that bug the crap out of me are, for example, on a motherboard, capacitor wine. That is a phenomenon, if you're not familiar, where the physical capacitors vibrate and they, they make a noise. So one very common thing is when you would move your mouse, you would hear geek, 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 coming off your motherboard. It's the physical capacitors making the wine. Some GPUs, video cards, would also do that in the past, maybe still in the, in the present. I haven't had one in a couple generations, but really annoying. So most important, when you figure out what processor what chipset, what overall feature set you want to go for, go online, all right? Choosing a motherboard and a case are the two most confusing and frustrating things, at least for me, when building a computer, because there are so many choices out there, so many features packed into them, and you need to make sure that everything is what you think it's gonna be for your build. For example, this was not my first motherboard choice. When I decided on the processor, I went with a 60, <clears throat> excuse me, 6700K, by the way, that you can see up front. I chose the Z170 chipset. It's more feature-proof than going with an X99. Feature-wise, they're about the same. The Z170 has a few minor advantages, but overall, pretty darn close as far as available features and overall performance. Okay, but I went with Z170, so I started looking around. My first choice was the Asus ROC, I believe it was the Hero, that had checked all my boxes for features I wanted. It was uh, didn't have anything I wasn't going to use. For example, I don't need a motherboard that supports four-way SLI. I'm never gonna use it. This one happens to support two-way SLI, which I'm still not going to use, but there's even one above this particular model. This is a classified K. I didn't need anything that I'm not gonna use, so I narrowed it down. Well, I went online and started reading all the reviews. And what I found, this is what you have to notice. You have to look for patterns. I noticed there was a fair amount of people having to RMA the 
Republic of Gaming from Asus series, and not just the hero, but a few of them. Okay, you know, that can happen. I was, the other important thing is, look at the dates. If they're recent, that could tell you there's a batch problem, and they were pretty recent, within a couple months. So, that still didn't turn me off from it. I can, I can stand having to RMA one part. Stuff happens. There may be one of these parts here that I will have to RMA. Odds are, it's probably gonna happen happens usually when you do a complete system, okay? That's just the way it is. But here's the thing that killed it for me for the ASUS series. The Hero and I think three of the other in the ROC series use the Realtek audio chipset, which is fine. This has the Realtek also. But on those motherboards, a lot of people were reporting the problem of when you turn on the computer, the speakers make a big pop sound and that would drive me insane to spend you know what 2500 bucks or so and to have it freaking pop through your speakers when you turn it on it would just drive me insane so forget it yes it might seem completely minor to you but here's the thing there are other motherboards out there with just as good if not better features this actually has a few more and they're all gonna be about equivalent in price. It's not like you have to be locked into a motherboard. So I went looking and I chose this one. This checked all my features. It has dual M.2 boards or slots built into it. I'm only using one at the moment, but I can plug in another drive if I need more space. Very cool. And I'll get into M.2 in a bit here when I get to my drive choice. It has more than enough USB 3, 3.1, to everything, uh, it supports up to 3600 megahertz RAM. I got 3200 megahertz. It's just perfect for my needs. And price-wise, it wasn't too bad. You are gonna pay through the nose for a top-of-the-line Z170 chipset though. So bear that in mind. There are the older generations like the uh, two-digit series, the X99s, they are going to be significantly cheaper by about a hundred bucks because it's the last generation technology. So you're paying for the faster features, especially RAM speed and things like that going with the Z170. So the processor, I went with the Intel 6700K. It is the top of the line Skylake architecture chip. It was important to me to go with Skylake number one because it's the current generation. It has all the new features that Intel has come out with. Yes, I could have went with Broadwell E. Feature-wise, pretty darn similar. Depending on what you do, a six-core Broadwell E compared to this quad-core Skylake is actually a little faster. However, not for what I do. And that's the important part. You have to weigh your options against what you actually do with a computer. My days are spent editing photos in Lightshop, <laughs> Lightroom and Photoshop, and editing videos in Premiere, doing website work and general internet stuff. General use, it doesn't matter what processor you have. You could have a Celeron, you could have a dual core Pentium. It's going to be just as good as a brand new thousand dollar, this isn't a thousand dollars, but brand new thousand dollar CPU. That's the point. You have to figure out what you're doing. Now, in my case, it was more important for me to have overall better speed for the entire core set. And this will overclock with a little bit of luck easily to 4.7 gigahertz on all four cores. Shouldn't be a problem at all. That's, that's a very rock solid, safe result that most everybody is getting out of it. Compared to say a six core Broadwell E that you're probably gonna get 4.3 or 4.4 out of. So a little bit slower, but you do have two more cores. Here's the thing, most games are not going to show any improvement going between four and six cores. Some don't even take advantage of more than four cores. For video rendering, more cores for most people is very important. And if I wasn't doing exactly what I do with my software, Broadwell E would have been the better choice, but I use Premiere and I use a renderer that takes advantage of CUDA for rendering. I use more uh, GPU than CPU. It's way faster, several times faster than just rendering with a CPU. So even though I've only got four cores, 
it's not even going to be using all of those four cores. It's going to be using my GPU. Broadwell E would have zero advantage. Now I get to enjoy all the advantages of having the faster clocked quad core, better gaming performance for just about every game out there, better overall system performance. Windows, just general use, does not take advantage of six cores. You're looking for that faster overall clock speed. So I went with the 6700 and that was the basis of my entire system. But if I was not rendering with CUDA, I would have went with the Broadwell E. Now to cool that CPU, I'm going with an all-in-one water cooling system. I have been running that type of system for about five years now and couldn't be happier. Oh man, I'll tell you what. The generations and the evolution of water cooling has been absolutely astounding to me. I've, I've done it all. Like I said, started with the complete DIY systems. I'm talking hand milled, not by me, but purchased from somebody that did it, water blocks. PVC tubing found it, uh, pet stores and aquarium pumps to move the stuff along, lots of part failures. Things started to evolve. Then very slowly, you would see things off the shelf. The big, I would say, launch to the whole water cooling craze was a company called Coolance. I don't even know if they're still around. I haven't seen anybody use them in a long time and I haven't used them in a long time, but I had multiple parts and multiple systems from Coolance, and they used to be really cool. They were the intermediate step between the DIY days that went on for a good five or six years to today, where you buy one box, everything is connected, you simply plug it in pretty much exactly like plugging in a normal fan and heat sink, screw in a few screws, and you're done. It's so simple. These work great. I'll get into choosing one in a bit, but the point of Coolance was they started off with just parts. You could buy water blocks for popular CPUs and popular graphics cards, and then they would have add-on parts. You still had to pipe the whole system yourself, but it was off the shelf. It was very expensive though. The first system I did with them, them it was a top mount system. It was basically like a miniature computer case that went on top of your case. And it housed a radiator inside, on the small side, a couple fans, a controller, the panel on the front that showed you your fan speed and temperature, built-in pump, and it had two lines out the back, one in, one out for the fluid. And you had to pipe that around outside your case, get it through the case somehow. Sometimes you would uh, have to cut the case. Later on, they came out with an adapter that went into one of your PCI slots and you could fit the tubes through in there you know, whatever you had to do. And then you built the cooling system around whatever you want. They had coolers for hard drives, all kinds of different stuff. And I had tons of system stuff like that. So that was fun, but things leaked. And like I said, it was very expensive. The controller units would often fail. The fans would start squeaking, get noisy. Overall, wasn't a great solution. Nothing like compared to today. Later on, I even had one of these. They had a their own case. It was that whole system built into the bottom of the case. You basically just plugged in your motherboard, CPU, GPU, whatever you wanted to cool. It was still custom on the inside, but it was all one nice unit. You didn't have some hokey thing sitting on top of your case. Then came all-in-one coolers. They've been around a number of years now. There's a couple different major brands out there. Here's a secret, they're all the same. I wouldn't be surprised if there's one factory in China making the actual guts of the things. Shop by price, shop by major features. Don't worry about if you're buying a Cooler Master or a Corsair. I happen to go with a Corsair. This is the H110i GTX. And I'll explain what the differences are. First of all, when you're choosing one, you have two main things to decide on. Single radiator or dual radiator. If you can go with a dual, go with a dual. What's gonna determine that is the room in your case. Some cases, like my current one, only have a spot to mount single fans anywhere. So you're limited to a single radiator system. And that means the radiator is the size of one 120 millimeter fan. And you simply put that in your case where the fan would go, and that's all you do. That's all you need. And it's working great. I have a single and my Sky, uh, not Sky, like my Sandy Bridge 2600K, goes from, I think stock was 3.4 gigahertz, and I had it running all day long at 4.4 gigahertz for years. 
So a nice bump up there with just a normal single radiator design. And I never heard the fan. It, it never bumped up, stayed really nice and cool. But if you can fit a dual, it's gonna be even cooler and it's gonna be even slower fan speeds and even lower noise. So this case and most modern cases have capacity for a dual radiator system. So you might wanna consider that. The price difference is very small between the two, usually 20 or 30 bucks. Now, once you determine that, say you go with a dual like this, you have the choice between going with a 120 millimeter fan size or 140. Bigger the better, same thing. Bigger the fan, more air, quieter. Definitely go with as big as you can fit. The 100 series is the 120, the 110 series is the 140. My case fits 140, so that's what I went with. Other than that, it's plug and play. The pump is built into the unit that sits on top of your CPU. You don't have any other heat sinks or fans on it, and it just sits there and silently circulates the fluid. You don't, there's nothing to fill. There's, there's no way to open it up, and that's it. You're good to go. You screw in your radiator, you screw in your fans, you plug everything in, and you're done. Beautiful systems. Let's talk about RAM. RAM affects every single thing you do in your computer. There are two choices to make when selecting RAM. You're gonna be locked into what speed of the overall RAM system you're using. For example, this is DDR4. Older motherboards are gonna use DDR3, for example. So you're locked into what type of RAM you have to use. Other than that, you have choices of the speed at which it performs. This is one of the fastest out there right now. It's 3,200 3, megahertz, which means it's processing its information very fast. Now, the important thing, the most important thing when buying RAM is make sure the specific sticks that you are buying are compatible with your motherboard because they are not all compatible with each other. Typically, if you go on the homepage or the webpage for the RAM manufacturer, look up that specific SKU, they will have a list of motherboards that it is guaranteed to work with. Some of the motherboard sites also will have a list on the motherboard page about which specific RAM kits are fully compatible. It doesn't mean those are the only things that will work. It just means they tested those and they give it the thumbs up. You can safely buy that combination. That being said, look in reviews because there are lots of people that will give results and say, hey, I tried this with this motherboard and it works or it didn't. So bear that in mind, do your research. The other thing you're gonna pay for are, is called timings. And along with the overall speed of how fast the chips are running, you have timings. And that is basically how efficient it runs. Small gains cost big bucks. This is the step down from the top of the line from G-Skill. Their top of the line series is called Trident. And this is the Ripjaws 5. The only difference between the Trident 3200 set and the Ripjaw 5 3200 set is the timings. And they are just slightly better on the Trident. But you pay a lot more. It's, you do not get a good return on your money as far as I'm concerned, from just paying for better timings. So bear that in mind. If that's not important to you, if maybe timings are super important to you, I'm not sure what type of work would most benefit from that. Possibly some real-time video editing, but I'll tell you what, I don't have any problem now, and my RAM is a lot older than this, a lot older. I believe my RAM now is running at 1800 megahertz, DDR3, so this is going to be way faster. I'm not going to notice the difference between this and the Trident. So I went with the Ripjaw 5s. Speaking about size of RAM, for gaming, you want a max of 16, gig, 16 gigs. Uh, you're not going to use any more than that. No game takes advantage of more than 16 gigs of RAM. Very few games take advantage of more than eight. That's all there is to it. Not much work that I even do goes above 16 gigs. About the only things that do is some video projects. I will need all 32. And if I'm editing a lot of big photos at the same time, which I sometimes do. If I'm, for example, opening a batch, 
With 32 gigs right now, I can open about 40 full res images, pull them into Photoshop, run some actions on them, and it's still fully running in RAM. That's important because if you run out of RAM in Photoshop, it goes to your swap, which means it's using your storage instead of RAM. Things get slow. So that's really all there is to the size of the RAM. Also bear in mind, some operating systems limit you to 16 gigabytes of RAM. For example, when I originally built my system that I'm currently on, I built it with 16 gigs of RAM and I was on Windows 7. Uh, I can't remember what version. Uh, I think it was just home or whatever they called it back then. Point is, I upgraded to 32, and I didn't know at the time that that version of Windows 7 didn't work with more than 16. I had to upgrade. I had to pay another 100 bucks to get the Windows 7 Pro, I think it's called. It's been a little while since I ran it. So bear that in mind. Check out your operating system and make sure if you're going more than 16 that it can support it or you might have to also purchase an upgrade. GPU. Now, this is gonna be of uh, most important to gamers. As far as gaming performance goes, GPU is king, CPU is secondary. There are a lot of CPUs out there. You can go as many as three generations behind and still get really close overall frame rate performance. Your GPU is what makes your gaming experience. I am not primarily building this as a gaming system. However, it is important to me. I do game. I do appreciate modern, very realistic looking high res games. And that does push a GPU. But like I said earlier, my video renderer uses CUDA cores. So the more the merrier. I went and chose the Asus ROC Strix 1070 OC Edition. The OC stands for overclocked. What that means is, for those of you that are new, overclocking is simply running the piece of equipment faster than the factory not so much recommended, but the factory guaranteed settings. And many things can be overclocked. The CPU, the RAM, the GPU, even the monitor itself, the physical screen, can all be, in some cases, overclocked. Some pieces of equipment, like the GPU, can be overclocked and get you big results. What's the downside of overclocking? Well, sometimes, it can break your item. It is a risk. It is a small risk, especially if you take care in how you overclock and exactly what settings you're using, but the risk is there. The factory will only guarantee it and really warranty it if it's been running at what they said to run it at. That being said, I've had excellent results and I have never, knock on wood, had any piece of equipment fail because of an overclock, period. It's very easy to do. The factory often gives you software to do it and they recommend doing it. They make it easy. It's something that is supposed to be done. Now, I said this is the OC edition, the overclocked edition, because here's what overclocking really is. When a part is produced, say for example, a GPU, the actual chip, the physical silicon chip. It's produced in the factory. They will then test that chip, and the same goes for CPUs. They will test the chip, and what they're testing for is errors, physical defects in the chip. If there are so many, it will not run at a certain speed. So for example, say they test for it running at 2 gigahertz, and it passes the test. Okay, that's a 2 gigahertz chip. Say it fails, Okay, they test it for 19 megahertz and it passes. Okay, that's a 19 megahertz chip. Say it failed. Okay, they tested for 18 gig. You get the idea. Whatever test, and by the way, these tests are very stringent beyond what anybody encounters in the real world. Whatever it hits and passes, that's what that chip is. Same thing for CPU speeds. They are not manufacturing different chips for the different speeds. They are simply what test that passed. They were all shooting for the, the fastest speed, but not all of them made it. So that's how they get the slower speeds. 
It's basically what degree of loser was physically produced. So that being said, this is one of the best for the 1070 chips. It passed all their top tests. This is the fastest one that they tested. They have other versions that are slower from the same company, same chip, but they're rated at a slower speed because they didn't pass the fastest tests. So out of the box, this is beyond what the maker, NVIDIA, said it's guaranteed to run at. The company that manufactured this card, Asus, tested it higher and they will guarantee it at that speed. Cool. So there are two reasons you might want to buy this over the base model. One, you don't have to do anything. If you want better than stock performance, you can plug it in and go. It's guaranteed to work quite a bit faster than a stock card and you don't have to do anything. It just runs great out of the box. But what it also means is because those tests are, like I said, way harder than anything in real life, there is more you can get out of it. And I will be overclocking even more than it is out of the box. So it's an overclock overclock. And that is what many gamers do. They will overclock it to the absolute max. And you do that through trial and error testing. You bump it up, run some special software to benchmark and test. If it fails, you turn it down a little bit. You keep doing that until it runs great and you've got your maximum overclock. Pretty much the same thing with doing the CPU and the RAM, but the RAM is a pain in the butt to do that because oftentimes that testing procedure takes days. So I don't overclock my RAM. That's why I bought the fastest one I could out of the box. I'm not gonna bother with that. That's great, done. GPU, very easy to do it yourself. So that's one reason to spend a little bit more money and get the fastest overclocked version you can, and you get a lot better performance. Let's talk storage. Primary storage. These days there is no reason, absolutely none, that everyone shouldn't be on an SSD or solid state device. This is such a huge difference from running on an uh, old hard drive. It's not even funny, I can't even tell you. Now, on an older computer, these days it's pretty easy to migrate over and get yourself on an SSD no matter what computer you're on. There are multiple sizes, multiple types, multiple speeds. It can be a little bit confusing. Talk to somebody about it that knows what they're doing. They can definitely steer you in the right direction, but any computer that is still running on a hard drive, you cannot fathom how much faster everything is about your experience. Boot up time, application launch, editing, rendering, loading games, playing games, the speed at which textures come into the screen. I mean, everything is way faster. It's not like, oh yeah, that, that's, I, that's a little fast. No, it's like, holy crap, what took five minutes now takes 10 seconds. No joke, some things are that dramatic. So my current system, I upgraded to an SSD years ago. And back then, the best you could do is called a SATA SSD, which means it plugs into the same type of slots, same connectors that the hard drives plug into. It's a direct one-to-one -one swap. The problem with that is the technology on the drives themselves, and I went with the absolute very fastest possible out right now, the new Samsung 950 Pro M.2 NVM. Talk about it in detail in a second, but the point is, you plug one of these in, replace your hard drive, you automatically have way faster performance. It doesn't matter, you can buy the slowest, cheapest SSD out there, and it's gonna blow away the fastest hard drive, okay? It's like comparing a motorcycle to a car. A slow motorcycle is better than a fast car. That's the difference. But between the slowest SSD and the fastest SSD is just as great a jump. My current system, I'm using a SATA 3 SSD. The technology on the chip itself very quickly hit the wall, hit the limit. It, was, it had the capability to run way faster 
than the interface that it was going through. Hard drives, optical drives, the first generation of SSDs are all going through the SATA interface, S-A-T-A. What that means is there is a speed limit because it's going through a middleman to get to your motherboard. Well, the solution to that was cut out the middleman. Put your storage drive directly on the motherboard. The first step in doing that were SSDs that were built into cards, just like you would put in a video card or put in an audio card. These would plug into the motherboard. Wow, cutting out that middleman, now all you're limited by is the speed of the chips on the card itself. And those were getting faster and faster and faster. They left SATA way behind. Well, those cards out there, up until recently, the best one was the Intel 750 series. Awesome card, and you could put it in virtually any computer because it was on a card. Current motherboards, the better ones, will have what's called an M.2 slot. It is a small dedicated slot just for SSDs built into the motherboard. So you, you don't even have to have a card. They also offer more performance than using a card. For example, one of the things that makes this thing so insanely fast, even compared to an Intel 750, is that it uses what are called pipes. It uses four pipes of the PCI on the motherboard. Long story short, this thing is just insanely fast and not that expensive. This is a 512 gigabyte, so half a terabyte. It also comes in a quarter terabyte. Here's a tip, don't just buy it based on your size needs. Most people, you know what, a quarter terabyte is more than enough. It's gonna hold your operating system, all your applications, tons of games, tons of files. You might still have a, a specific storage drive if you have a whole lot of files, but it's more than enough for most people. My current SSD is a 128 gigabyte and it sits there with usually about 190 full. I'll put files on there that I'm working on and then move them off to the drive, my big storage drives when I'm done. So it's not a big deal. But even if, and I'm, I'm not gonna come close to filling up a half terabyte on this. Here's the thing. The larger capacities are also much faster. This is way faster than the 256 version because of how the chips are physically put on the drive itself. So it's not like hard drives where you can decide on a four terabyte or a five terabyte, they're the same speed, you're just buying more storage. That's not the case with SSDs. The larger the size, the also faster the speed. So that's a big tip for that guy right there. Now this, <laughs> I had a couple people stumped on, why I would need an adapter. This is an adapter to plug one of these new M.2s into an older computer that doesn't have the M.2 slot. It plugs it into a SATA interface. Now, for those of you keeping up, you're thinking, well, why would you plug a really fast card into an old interface and then bottleneck it? This is not for the new computer. This is to transfer my old drive and clone it onto the new one. So I don't have to waste hours and hours loading up Windows again, configuring it the way I like it, doing all the updates. I can spend 10 minutes. I plug the new drive into this. I plug this whole thing into my old computer. I run the cloning software that comes with that drive. It copies my existing one onto that. This goes in and I'm done really simple. Now there's a little bit more config you have to do after that, but in short, that's all you need. This was 14 bucks shipped and saves me, no joke, about three hours of time. Well worth it to me. Now, that being said, if you are working with a really old computer, or if you've had that operating system installed for more than a couple years, you're gonna to wanna to do a fresh load anyway. The only reason I'm doing this is because I just did it. Not even three weeks ago. It's a fresh load on my current system. I took advantage at the last minute of the Windows 10 upgrade. I went from seven to 10 Pro and did a fresh load. So it's good to go. It's not bloated. It is exactly like I want it and I don't wanna go through all that again. So that's why I'm cloning. Like I said, 
If it's more, if you've had Windows installed for more than a couple years, don't clone your drive. Do a fresh install. It will be much better for you overall. Main storage. Now, this is going to be something that's very unique to everybody's specific needs. Me, like I said, photo, photo and video editing equals a lot of files, but I need to access those files very quickly, especially reading them. This is one thing that some of you might disagree about, but I've been doing it this way for many, many, many years, only had one failure and it was my fault. I'm running it as a RAID 0 array. I'm running two Western Digital black drives. I have used those things, I don't know, 15, 20 years since they've been around. I've absolutely loved the Western Digital black drives. They are the top of the line normal consumer drives. They used to have a 10,000 RPM series of Raptors and I haven't even looked to see if they make those anymore, but they were horrendously loud. They had the better performance, but they did not have the longevity and just unusable in a home system. They were just so loud. So I've loved the Western Digital Blacks. They've evolved over the years. That being said, just like doing your research on other stuff, read reviews. And there are a few sites out there that do very important longevity tests on a lot of the manufacturers and a lot of their series of drives. Now, Here's the thing, the Western Digital Blacks right now are offered in, I believe, seven different sizes, ranging from one terabyte through six or seven. I can't remember, I know they at least had six. The sixes were reported with a pretty significant jump in problems over the fives. The four and the fives were one specific generation of manufacturing, and they were pretty good. Everyone's gonna have problems. There's no drive out there that's absolutely perfect. You're never gonna have a problem with. You have to read reviews, look at the overall trends. But they went to the six terabyte and larger and things got noticeably more sketchy. So I went with two five terabyte drives to giving me 10 total. And being in RAID zero, what that does is the system will be using both at the same time, writing half of the information to one and half of the information to the other at the same time, meaning you get double the performance. It's reading and writing both drives at the same time, but it's splitting up whatever it's reading and writing. So it only has to write and read half onto each drive and it's doing it in parallel. It really does double the speed of whatever you make into a RAID array. It's very simple to do these days. It's built into the motherboard, into the UEFI or the BIOS. It's a no brainer. The only failure I ever had, and I've been running these things 24 seven, 365 for, I don't know how many years, is when I had to drive overheat because the cooling fan stopped working because it got clogged up because I didn't clean it and it overheated one of the drives in the array. That is the downfall of a RAID zero array. If one of the drives breaks, all of the data is gone. There are other RAID solutions out there that protect you against that, but it involves more drives. For example, four drives, writing, writing, and mirroring. There's also RAID 5, which uses more drives. It's, the point is, it stacks up. Take care of your system. Odds are, knock on wood, you're not gonna have an issue. I have no problem with it, even if I do have a failure, because everything I have is always backed up. So I don't lose anything no matter what happens. That's very important to have a backup strategy, especially if you choose a RAID 0 array. And here's a tip, never run a RAID 0 array as your C drive. If you're gonna run a big array like this, even if you're not doing SSD, use a, use a single hard drive as your C drive. You will run into some problems if you have even little glitches on a RAID 0 array. And the last thing you want is not to be able to boot into your system to even check things out or pull data. So keep them separate. One other thing that's very important to me is silence. I work in a very quiet environment and fan noise just drives me bonkers. I have always strived to make as quiet a system as possible. When I finally went to water cooling and was able to use systems that had quiet fans. Oh my goodness, was that a huge benefit. Since then, I have tried to find the best and quietest fans out there. 
these are what I've been using for many years. Now there are several brands out there of silent or very quiet fans on the market. I can't account for any of the other ones, but I can tell you without fail, these are excellent. They are truly whisper silent. You have to get this close to even hear it. They are really quiet. They use fluid bearings. They may as well not be there. They may as well not be on. And they're high performance, very high pressure, very low RPM, but high airflow. They're excellent for case fans. They're excellent for radiator fans. So I'm replacing the two fans that come with this Corsair unit because they're not silent. Some people are saying, uh, you know, they're quiet to them, but they're not anywhere near the sound level of these, which is virtually zero. I do not want to hear anything. So off these fans come and on go these two 140 millimeter. And I got orange just because I like it. I've got a bunch of orange ones in the current system. It goes really cool black. And I will slightly see these under the top of my grill on the new case. So I went with two 140s here. There is a 120 millimeter fan in the back of the case. That's what this is going to be replacing so that I will have nice silent fans. And like I said, the 200 millimeter fan that's coming to replace the front fan in the case is also a silent fan. Everything came in separate shipments. I think I had seven or eight different shipments come in for this order. <laughs> a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, Oh, my heat sink compound, nothing really there to talk about. Arctic Silver, use the compound of your choice. I've used many of them over the years. Uh, haven't really seen any difference between the two or between the different types. Just get whatever is currently top of the line produced and you're good. A few bucks there. Last but not least. Oh, no, two different things. Let's talk about keyboards. I have loved the feel of mechanical keyboards. Used them from my very first computer, an IBM PS1. Clickety click, electronic, fantastic feel. Very fast to type on if you're a typist. Very nice. I mean, it is a great tangible feeling. Not everybody likes it, but I do. And you have to experience it for yourself. Here's a tip. Head on down to your local Best Buy. Mine here, at least, had a great selection of them sitting on the shelf for you to feel out and try. But don't go in the computer section. They're hiding them over by the gaming consoles. I have no idea why, because they have nothing to do with gaming consoles, but everything gaming oriented, and most mechanical keyboards are gaming oriented, are over there. So you can try them all out. There are many different types of physical keys. This is what's important when choosing a mechanical keyboard. There are pros and cons to all the different types, and you have to make a personal decision about what's good for your situation. For example, one particular company that makes the physical key switches is called MX, MX Cherry. They're called MX Cherry switches. There are different types, and they go by colors. For example, MX Cherry Blue switches are the typical old school ones that you, if you're older, are going to remember. Click, click, click. They have a very indented spring. They have a little punch to it when you type the key. Okay, those are the classic type of click, click, click. They're loud. They might feel great, but they're loud and there's nothing you can do about it. They're designed to be that way. It can drive people crazy. Now, if you live alone, hey, go for it. They're often the cheapest ones out there. Sometimes you'll have keyboards. For example, this is offered in two or three different types of switches. Same keyboard. They just give you your choice. The blues are cheap. It's typically half the price of other options because nobody wants them. There are a lot of offices out there that ban them because they drive everybody crazy. Imagine 20 people going click, 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 click every keystroke. No, thank you. So, over the past several years, different switches have been developed. Some are quieter, some are quieter and feel different. Some have a different travel, the amount of how far down you have to press the keys. It's all personal preference. 
And my, even if you go to YouTube, I know there are a lot of comparison videos out there between the keys and they'll put up a microphone and, and they'll compare the different sound levels between the different types of switches. That still doesn't tell you how loud they really are in real life because you don't know what volume you're supposed to be playing it at. So go to a store like Best Buy that has them there for you to physically try out. That's my number one tip. Now, why I have resisted until now, I don't use them right now, using them is because none of them were quiet enough for me. I work a lot at night and my wife is sleeping in the bedroom one door down the hallway. And if I'm typing all night, clickety click, or even clickety click, it's gonna wake her up, it's gonna drive her nuts. I use a basic Microsoft $8 keyboard, no joke. And I, I like it, I have no problems with it. It's nice and quiet, feels as good as any kind of normal keyboard would, nothing unusual, but that's it. This one has brand new switches called MX Cherry Silent. And they are quiet. They are quieter than my normal keyboard now. Absolutely amazing. The feel, you're either gonna love it or hate it. I like it. It, it is mechanical, but it's not the typical click feel. It is dampened. If you are now running with MX Cherry, switch, uh, MX Cherry Red switches, it is very equivalent to putting O-rings on those, just for reference but I love it. This is gonna be absolutely great for my needs. Now, the benefits over it, the benefits of a mechanical over a normal keyboard. Again, a lot of personal preference. It's the feel, it's the build quality. This thing is heavy. It's about five pounds for a keyboard. It's metal, but I work in the dark. It's a backlit keyboard. It actually has RGB lights under every single key. You can make different keys different colors. You can vary the intensity. You can make it look and do whatever you want to. I just really want a nice backlit keyboard, especially now with this new desk, my monitor is gonna be farther back. Right now, my keyboard is pretty bathed in monitor light and I don't need a backlight, but I could use one. And I think with this new desk, I will need it. So I'm very happy that I got this. Not cheap. This is the huge downside to mechanical keyboards. 160 bucks with tax. So compared to $8, <laughs> yeah, you have, to, you have to really weigh the pros and cons. Now there are cheap ones out there. They go as low as 50 bucks especially from places that are just making them in China. But really do your research because those cheap ones, they're cheap. To me, they're not, if you're not spending at least a hundred bucks, you're getting a piece of crap. Do your research. All right, last but not least, bias lighting. This is something that's been around a long time as far as a concept. I've run these custom in my home theaters for many years. I bought my first big screen TV in 2000 or 2001, and it was a rear projection, one of those old school cabinet rolling TVs, right? So what bias lighting is, the whole concept is, the way your eyes perceive color and contrast and sharpness can be very dependent on the ambient light around what you're watching. What that means is you want a little bit of light on the wall behind your TV. You don't want, unless it's completely black, you don't want a dark room. If you can completely black it out, that's one thing, like a theater, because all you see is the picture. But if there's any kind of sort of light going on, your eyes are strained. So what bias lighting does is bathes the wall in a specific tone and density of light. And that changes the perception of the screen to your eyes. Well, the same thing can be done in an office. And they have all kinds of kits now. What I had to do back in the day, because there was nothing off the shelf, just like with water cooling, you made your own. You went to Home Depot, you got a um, specific size and uh, type of bulb, make your own little 
you know, light setup and then put some very specific window tint over it. And that gave you the specific color and intensity of light to shine on your wall, which also ideally had to be a certain shade of paint. <laughs> so it got quite involved. These days, everything's flat screen. And with the invention of LED strips, it's a no brainer. These things are 15 to 20 bucks. They have all kinds of different lengths and sizes. This particular one is for a home theater. So it's about a 50 inch strip. What I'm gonna use it for is putting it on the back of my desk. So you can put it on the back of your monitor, but I want more width. So I'm putting it on the back of the desk. What I've got here also goes on the back of the desk. It's a wire organizer. It's a self-adhesive J hook. It's an open channel and this will be hanging down behind the back of my desk and this will allow me to channel all my wires anywhere I want to along the desk and not have anything showing underneath. And then on top of that, this sticks on, it's self-adhesive. Now when you're buying these, what you want to look for, is my light going dim? I think it is. <laughs> I'll wrap this up. What you want to look for is the length of the LEDs and the length of control cables. They're pretty much all controlled by USB these days. So you just plug it into your back of your monitor or your computer, it'll come on and off automatically. This one has a dimmer control, but more importantly, it has a little lead from the end of the LEDs to the controller. Some of them, they're right on the end. So it might be inconvenient to get to the controller. Like I said, 15, 20 bucks, definitely worth it. Especially now that I'm building a new office. All right, guys, that's it. I will have a cool build video where I actually construct it all. And then after that, I'll have a show off of the finished product and a couple benchmarks, and we'll see how much better the new system performs. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Give me a thumbs up, and we'll see you next time.